which is why, you know, this business, I mean, I know why it's happening. Thank you all for being here today, and it's a real pleasure to welcome our guest, Tevi Troy, to be with us. Um, Tevi Troy has served in a variety of positions, including Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services in the government. He has written, I think you said, 400 articles and several books, including his most recent one, Fight House, Rivalries in the White House from Truman to Trump. Um, he is published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Politico, and the Atlantic. And he currently is a senior fellow of the Bipartisan Policy Center where he's working on a project that uh, I helped him develop on the American presidency. One of the things that surprised me, and I think heavy at the time, was that um, there was really, despite the importance and uniqueness of the office of the presidency, there wasn't much by way of scholarly interest in it. And in fact, the one main program, the faculty member had just retired and his university decided not to continue it. Um, so that is what he's doing now, but I've known Tevi for about 30 years as he was finishing his PhD at the University of Texas in American Studies, I think. Um, he applied for and was given a Herman Kahn Fellowship at the Hudson Institute, which was then in Indianapolis, in which I headed. Uh, and this was the beginning, really, in many ways, of what has turned out to be an exceptional career and shows, again, how providing funds for talented people is one of the best uses one can make uh, of philanthropic dollars. So Kevin's going to talk with us today. The title of his talk is The President We Need, Finding Leadership in Our Presidents and Ourselves. So without further ado, I'll pass it to you, Kevin. Thank you, Les, for the introduction and for hosting me here in Wilmington and for the leader of mentorship over the years. And thank you, Professor Aurelian, not only for having me in class yesterday, but also for having Les read the introduction, because it's very flattering to hear my mentor read this uh, <laughs> introduction. So thank you. Uh, it's uh, obviously not a huge group, so I'm not going to be too formal. Uh, some of our style might be take questions and stuff. But I just want to talk a little bit about my interest in the presidency. As Les said, I worked in the White House, and I also have a PhD in American Studies, and I focused on the presidency dissertation, which later became my first book, was on intellectuals and the American presidency. And so when I left the White House, when I left serving the government, I had this unique combination of being an expert on the presidency from a practical perspective, having worked in the White House at a senior level of multiple jobs, but also from an academic perspective, having studied it, gone to the archives and looked at the memos that Pat Moynihan wrote to Richard Nixon and he makes it sprawl on the side of the memos responding to the points that that Moynihan made, and not just that uh, library, but the Kennedy Library and the uh, Johnson Library, and a whole host of presidential libraries that helped get me to uh, really get the information I needed to write my dissertation and then book. But also, it had me read deeply into the literature about the presidency, which is a very rich and fascinating literature and, and very useful. My mentor at the University of Texas was a woman named Elspeth, Elspeth Rostow. Does anybody know the name Walt Rostow? He was Johnson, first candidate, and then Johnson's national security advisor. And he was instrumental in many of the decisions leading up to the Vietnam War and the prosecution of the Vietnam War. And so his wife, who's an expert on the presidency, was there during the Kennedy administration, during the Johnson administration. So she also had this academic sense of it, but she was also deeply immersed in the earlier era of the presidency. So I gave me this understanding of the presidency from both perspectives, the academic and the practical. And I've tried to take that perspective and apply it in my subsequent career as a writer and thinker on the presidency. So supportive, uh, so appreciative of Les's work helping to support my work on that. Recently, I've been doing an examination of leadership in the presidency and how leadership is so important. And we look around today, 
And you know, whatever party you're from, I think uh, there's a lot of disappointment in some of the recent leadership examples that we've seen in the Oval Office. And you know, let's make it up there. It's told to show that overwhelming numbers of the American people do not want the 2024 race to be a rematch of Joe Biden and Donald Trump, even though it is shaping up to be that. Uh, Necessarily need to believe in straight line extrapolation predictions, sometimes exchange. But the most likely scenario at this current moment in April of 2023 is that you'll have those same two people run for president in their early 80s, uh, which is not necessarily what we want. You know, it's very interesting. 1946 is the year that Donald Trump was born. And in that same year, George W. Bush and Bill Clinton were also born. So it's the only year in which three presidents were born in one year. Uh, Joe Biden, the president today, Bill Clinton was elected president in 1992. Joe Biden then, 1992, when Bill Clinton was elected, was older than Bill Clinton was when he was serving president. Still is <laughs> older. Uh, so it just gives you a sense of the perspective of the two most recent presidents. And, and it, you know, it could be that the uh, generation that follows the baby boomers, the Gen X generation, uh, never has a president because by the time. Trump and Biden are off the stage. We're going to move into uh, Gen Z and then the subsequent gen generation. So uh, generational leadership is part of this. But I, when I look at the presidency, um, and again, a period of uh, disappointing presidents, I'd say, uh, we also had a period of disappointing presidents in the 70s, uh, in the late 70s, uh, when you Richard Nixon, obviously, had a very scandal. And um, Gerald Ford was there very, very briefly. And, that's known for pardoning Nixon, which uh, I think was good for the country, but bad for his sort of election prospects. And then you think Jimmy Carter, his, own, his presidency was also seen as a, as a failure. Um, and you realize that sometimes we just kind of get duds as president. In the period leading up to the Civil War, we had a Millard Fillmore and James Buchanan. And Buchanan, for my money, is still the worst president we've ever had. I mean, really, you know, fiddled while Rome burned in terms of doing nothing or even worsening, exacerbating the situation as we got closer and closer to civil war. But just because you have a run of bad mediocre presidents doesn't mean that things can't turn around. Like the candidate was followed by Lincoln. And I was on Grace Park. And I recall a humor story about the 1980 campaign when Ronald Reagan is running for office and he tells his campaign rallies the story. He's sleeping and he had this dream. In the dream, Jimmy Carter came to him and he said, Ronnie, you're always out there campaigning, campaigning, campaigning against me. Why? Why do you want my job so badly? And Reagan, in the dream, responds, Jimmy, I don't want your job. I want to be president. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, you know, it showed Reagan's humor, but it's also kind of a delicate crack at the way Carter. Good humor. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think humor is important with the presidency. You know, from what I see of both Trump and Joe, Joe Biden, I think neither of them has any capacity to laugh at themselves. Uh, it reminds me of a story that uh, when, when John F. Kennedy was president, he made his brother, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, the attorney general. Robert F. Kennedy was all 35 years old. And Robert F. Kennedy. I don't think I'm being uh, too rude here. He had zero qualifications. I don't think he even practiced law. Probably. He, he had, did have a law degree from the University of Virginia. Congressional aid. He was congressional aid working on investigations. But anyway, I mean, he was, yeah, I think it's safe to say the least qualified person to be attorney general in the last century. So um, in, the, in the kind of press conference introducing Robert F. Kennedy, to be the attorney general, John F. Kennedy makes a note, a joke. He said, yeah, well, we wanted uh, Bobby to have a chance to be attorney general before he started to practice law. And Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy was irate at his brother for saying that. And he said to his brother afterwards, he said, that was horrible. I can't believe you said that. I mean, that's terrible. And John F. Kennedy said, come on, Bobby. I'll fix it. You'll be able to laugh at her yourself. And Bobby said to him, John, you weren't laughing at yourself. You were laughing at me. <laughs> and then, to be fair to Kennedy, I mean, he also had self deprecating humor. I mentioned this joke earlier. What lesser, I'm really less than my sharp to take me around and trying not to warn him with repeat stories. Uh, but this one is just too fitting at the moment because um, there's a story that John F. Kennedy was obviously uh, from a very wealthy family. It's kind of fun. Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger, uh, Wall Street guy, uh, movie mogul, and he made, made a lot, a lot of money. 
um, and he helped fund the Kennedy's political careers. At one point, John F. Kennedy wins a close race, and he jokes about the closeness of the race afterwards by saying that he got a telegram from his dad, and the telegram says, I'm happy to buy you an election, but I damn sure wasn't going to pay for a landslide. Plainly, <laughs> the other the race. So, um, so you know, he was willing. Again, again, maybe that wasn't uh, his own expense. A little bit of his father's expense too, but, uh, but a little bit. So, um, so I think humor is important, um, and it got me thinking about the uh, the characteristics of leadership. What you're looking for in a president, and what we can find in a president that maybe get us out of our current morass. And so, my study of White House and working there just you know, led me to an exploration of different areas in which presidents have to have some competency. Um, so first of all, they have to have certain characteristics in terms of communication and openness and uh, a little sense of humor, a little laugh at yourself, uh, some connectedness to the culture. I think these are all really important. But the other things you have to do is when you serve in a White House, you preside over a bunch of aggressive, sharp elbow type of a very smart personalities uh, in very high stakes situation, in a very closed, tight environment, in a very narrow window, or a certain amount of time for making present, in which everything is incredibly high stakes. And all of those things are conducive to infighting. And we see a lot of infighting in multiple administrations, not least in the, in the Trump administration, but pretty much every presidency you look at, if you really look at it, you'll see you'll find a lot of uh, infighting. We, um, we read this book on the Reagan administration, uh, foreign policy. And the Reagan administration for a while, see, I would argue, was quite successful. Uh, but at the same time, the internal dynamics, people fighting at each other and at each other, sort of truly hating each other. I mean, Don Regan was the chief of staff, and he hated Bud McFarland, who's the national security advisor. And the Iran Contra affair takes place in the Reagan administration. We can do this uh, query, but how many people know the Iran Contra affair? Okay, so the Iran Contra affair, uh, I'll just say it very quickly, was a scandal in the Reagan administration in which they were hostages taken by elements, radical elements close to Iran. And the US was trying to get those hostages out. They promised elements within the Iranian government or close to the Iranian government, or someone for sure, that they would provide arms sales to Iran, which was an enemy of the US that the US did not have diplomatic relations with. They would give them arms sales in exchange for consideration of release of these hostages. And you probably don't need to tell me it didn't work out. The Iranians got these arms and missiles and the US did not get the hostages released. And at the same time, the proceeds from those sales had to fund the anti-communist rebels in Nicaragua, the Nicaraguan countries. And these Nicaraguan countries had expressly been pro prohibited from Congress from getting US government support. So it was a scandal on multiple levels. They were giving arms to an enemy. They were giving money to a group that Congress that we couldn't give money to. When I say we, I'm talking about the US government, not me, because it's there. Um, and, and it was also at the heart of it, is there was a failure. Okay, we did, we went against our no negotiating with terrorists ethos in exchange for nothing being involved. So the Iran Costa affair comes, a massive scandal, big problem, heads roll. And Bud McFarland is the national security advisor, and to some degree, he takes the fall for it. And he is so upset by this humiliation. I mean, still the stain on his resume, first line in so much, right? But he tries to commit suicide. And it's unsuccessful, he survives. And uh, Regan, who hated him, is supposed to have said in the aftermath, he said, poor dumb son of a bitch can't even kill himself, right? Uh, and that's pretty harsh, right? And so, you know, there, there's real enmities inside the administrations. People really go at each other's throats. And a wise president, a smart president, needs to know how to manage it. I don't say, no, 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 that's my verb choice. I don't say eliminate it, manage it. Because there's always going to be infighting in the presidency, probably in whatever organization you work with. But like, the higher the stakes, the uh, sharp, the more sharp level of the people, the uh, more intensity, the pressure, the more scrutiny that leads to more of it. And you have to figure out a way to manage it. And there's a continuum, I have argued, you know, on one side, complete dysfunction where you can't trust anyone and anything you say will be leaked to the media the next minute. I would say we'll call this the Trump administration. But on the other hand, you know, let's look at the Lyndon Johnson administration. Lyndon Johnson did not want any dissent on Vietnam. He didn't want to hear alternative voices. And so there was a group of people at the State Department who saw that things weren't going great. They wanted to discuss alternative ways to fix those meetings. And 
They were so scared that Johnson would know what they're up to and that they were actually being disloyal and discussing the, uh, the ways to improve in, in Vietnam. And they called themselves the non-group. So they didn't have a name for their group, they were the non-group, and they met secretly through Johnson and Monroe Valley. Well, that's another form of dysfunction. And they're concerned openly that you're really not having a healthy kind of discussion you need. And so you need to find a way along this continuum to find out the creative tension that can lead to good results, but you can also allow people to trust each other and walk out the door at the end of the day after the president has made a decision, after hearing all sides in a fair way, so you can lock arms and say, okay, I may have lost this debate, but I had my voice heard, maybe my voice shaped a little bit of the way things go when you can have things made until I can test the way. And now I and the rest of the team are going to be on board with the president's policy. So you know, finding a way to manage infighting is the only thing. I think you are a problem for the moment. I'd like to be the deputies, but you've been promoted. I am pleased to. Leave that it's not the hotel of California. You can check out any time. <laughs> As a Californian, I'm glad to check out from that hotel. <laughs> so, in, in addition to, uh, to finding a way to manage infighting in an appropriate way, there's also a disaster. I worked a lot on disaster, talked about John Class recently. Uh, but when you're president, a lot of disasters are going to come your way. And you never know what they're going to be. You have to prepare for them, you have to know. What's going to come? And this is true in any in any business. In every business can do tabletop exercises to figure out what could go wrong. I mean, there are now these uh, bugs that you can put in your program intentionally to create a system shutdown, and then you check all your team and see what they do when the system shuts down. Do they behave appropriately? And if they don't, you figure out how to fix it the next time. So uh, you can't go into a disaster without knowing what the plan is for dealing with. It. Disaster and uh, it requires some real thought. And I would say that the US government actually spent time and you know, billions of dollars in pre preparing for uh, bio uh, attacks or, or bio disasters uh, in terms of uh, disease outbreaks like we saw in COVID. And it was a failure. The US had three layers of defense for infectious diseases. Number one was international monitoring, including what's going on in, in other countries to see if something is right here. Number two was a system of infection controls that included testing and tracing and tracking and isolating people who have the disease. And number three is a strategic national stockpile, something we spend billions of dollars on that has countermeasures, whether they are vaccines or therapeutics that can respond to whatever comes our way. And when coronavirus came, we failed on all three levels. First one, in terms of international monitoring, the Chinese government was not truthful, not forthcoming about the level of the problem. And the U.S. government, I think, one of the reasons for this, in 2003, there was a disease called SARS that broke out in China. The Chinese government wasn't honest about it. The disease spun out of control in China, caused a lot of economic, health, and reputational damage to the Chinese government. And they said, we're going to do better going forward. And they had. There were other disease outbreaks in China in the interim period in which China responded better and was more forthcoming in both the U.S. and the World Health Organization was going on. Uh, but I don't think the U.S. accounted for the degree to which things, and again, at the time, going back to 2019, 2020, to the degree to which things had changed under Xi, under Xi, the new Chinese leader, and he was in a less cooperative vein. And I just don't think the U.S. incorporated that into their thinking when you had the coronavirus outbreak. I think the U.S. was caught a little bit unaware. The second level of defense, uh, when I saw the testing, tracking, tracing, isolating, uh, good infection controls, is inherently the core of that is to have some kind of test that can tell you whether people have it. And we all know the story that CDC royally screwed up the tests and in their arrogance would not let other organizations develop tests, meaning all the sector and nonprofits develop the tests. They insisted that they had to be the one to develop the tests. And they used the FDA as their enforcer, telling people there's even a lab in the Seattle area that was developing a test that would have worked in the early days. And the FDA at CDC's behest went and said, stop what you're doing, stop developing this test. So um, that was a screw up in the second level. And the third level is strategic national stockpile, which we spent billions of dollars on. And 
It's something I wrote about in my book, shall we, in 2016, that we have nothing in the strategic national stockpile for coronavirus. I didn't know it was going to be SARS CoV 2. I mean, I'm not a prophet exactly what was coming, but I knew that the coronavirus was a problem and we had nothing for it. And again, I, you know, I wasn't looking at a magic ball, I could talk to experts. An expert said, hey, this is a disease of origin. It's, we've had outbreaks like the SARS outbreak in 2003, and we don't have anything to stop about. So uh, that's why I wrote it. Uh, but we, we had nothing, and it took you know, a year and a lot of uh, pain and treasure loss and blood loss uh, until we got the, the vaccine. And even when we got the vaccine, you know, I've taken three, four, uh, you know, I've taken a lot of uh, vaccine hits, and I'm glad I took it, and I got COVID, and I think my disease was probably less severe because I had taken the vaccine. Although we don't know that it could be that the strains had evolved to be yeah. most deadly. But anyway, I happily took the vaccine multiple times, uh, but I think we sold them well. I think we said the vaccine will prevent spread and they did not prevent spread. They did likely prevent severe outbreaks or, or severe cases, or limit the, or reduce the severity of the case. And I just think we should have been more honest about what it was that the um, that the vaccines did. But that said, have, being ready for these kinds of disasters I think is essential for the president. The next thing, um, I mentioned preparation for disaster, but preparation in everything you do. I think the way you prepare will shape the way your team prepares. And if people see you winging it, they're going to win. And that affects performance up and down in administration, up and down in organization. And so we've seen multiple presidents over time. Uh, let's say not taking the debates as seriously as they need. We saw this with Obama in 2012 in the first debate against Romney. He didn't put in the time to prepare for it as much as he should. And Romney really beat him up pretty badly. Obama righted the ship in the next two debates and you know, had some help from certain moderators like Ken Crowley. But uh, it's a kind of recurring theme that incumbent presidents do poorly in their first debates because all they hear is, oh, you're so great, Mr. President. You're fantastic, Mr. President. They're never challenged as president. Way. And in the debate, you have someone who's on equal footing with you. It's not like a, in a press conference where you can say, I'm not going to take your question, I will take your question. It's, you know, you're one on one with this person who's trying to destroy you in order to advance that person's political interests. And that person is likely equally as talented in the political sphere as you are. That person's coming after you. And a lot of presidents don't properly prepare for it. Ronald Reagan did poorly in his first debate against Walter Mondale. Leading to questions about whether he was too old and firm to continue on as president. He read the ship in the second debate. Uh, George H.W. Bush did poorly in his debate against uh, when he was incumbent against, uh, against Bill Clinton. Now, Bill Clinton, I think, was a unique politically uh, political talent and probably would have done uh, well no matter what against George H.W. Bush, but still yeah. you know, the, the insufficiency of preparation. And look at Trump against Biden. I mean, Trump was having multiple prep sessions with his advisors, where they said to him, Mr. President, Biden's problem is he talks too much. And when he talks too much, he says things he shouldn't say. Don't talk too much, let him say what he has to say. And if you recall in that first debate, which I think was, and I studied a lot of these debates, was the worst performance by any presidential candidate, uh, certainly any sitting president, definitely any sitting president, but any presidential candidate. The absolute worst performance was, was Trump in that first debate to the extent where Biden, remember the strategy was let Biden talk and Biden had to say to Trump, shut up, man, because he wasn't getting a word in there. And, you know, I've never seen it in watching Joe Biden for 40 years, see it in, in, in a situation where Joe Biden couldn't get a word in. I mean, the guy lives to just you know, get a word in, you know, as long as he talks, he, he talks too much. And so there's either insufficient preparation or inability to listen to the preparation. That, that was all that. And then the last one, is about legacy. And you think about moving forward, you're not going to be there forever. What happens after you? And you think of who's going to be your successor. And can you groom and cultivate that successor so that your legacy lives on in the people who come after you? And we see this around the world that there are, you know, people are not good at it. And, uh, one of the problems with our, with our childhood Russia is that Putin has no successor, has no plan for a successor, and we have no idea what Putin's successor would look like. One of the reasons we're having all this turmoil in Israel is because Netanyahu not only can't cultivate a successor, but he alienates all his proteges. 
and his proteges end up becoming his most bitter political opponents who run against him. Naftali Bennett, who was the prime minister, uh, was, was Netanyahu's chief aide for a while. And then he decided that he hated him and couldn't work with him anymore. He had him multiple times. So the inability to cultivate a successor, I think, is a real problem. There's obviously a Trumpist movement in the US. When Trump retires or dies and we're off the scene, I don't know who his successor is. And, and Trump is probably too egotistical to name one. So um, inability to develop a successor and create a legacy, I think, is a real problem. So these are some of the challenges the president's faced. The good news is that history gives us some answers for how to do better on these situations. And in addition to that, these are things that I think are not only useful to you if you're president, but if you lead any organization, or just in your own personal lives, these, these are not skills. Like it's not like I'm trying to teach you basketball and say you have to be 6'6 and as good as Michael Jordan. These are skills that you can develop in your own life thinking about how you want to proceed and what you want to do, how you prepare for, for big moments, how you can control tension, not only within your organization, but in your family, how you can, um, how you can think about when things go wrong, what are you going to do, are you going to be ready? And so I think in finding these characteristics, these tendencies, um, hopefully we can create, we can develop the president we need going forward. We can also find the leadership on ourselves that we need to get us out of our difficult situation. With that, I happily take questions. Great, thank you very much. Now time for questions. Um, I'll begin perhaps with the first question and then I hope you join in. So you were here as a guest of the Tocqueville program in a building infused with the spirit of Alex de Tocqueville. Uh, and we often overlook the fact that he was not the only foreign visitor to come to the United States and try and figure out what was driving our political system. And about 50 years, more or less, afterwards, an Englishman named Rice came to the United States and produced also two volumes, very thick volumes, very thick volumes that have not stood the test of time to the extent Tocqueville has. Uh, called the American Commonwealth. But there is a very interesting chapter, I forget which volume it's in, in which he, I think it's actually, the title was Why Great Men Are Not Elected President. Uh, and he argued, if I remember correctly, and he's of course implicitly comparing the United States to the UK. Uh, and he's saying that uh, the difference is the UK institutions were arranged in such a way that people of real talent would emerge and become prime minister. But in the United States, we suffered from an excess of democracy. And so the uh, key attribute of a president would be to appeal to the middling Americans. And we reflected in the person's abilities as well. Um, you think that part of the challenge of the president is how to lead in an increasingly complex world uh, when, in fact, you're accountable to a large number of people, and we were talking about this earlier, who are increasingly less knowledgeable about history, world situation, artificial intelligence, whatever. Is there something about a demo, the office of the presidency that inevitably produces middling people? Yeah, can I follow up question? Because my MPSA presentation, yeah, that's we can just about this. 30 years after maybe Bryce, Mr. Bryce visit to America, not well, the most important one in Chinese intellectual Shi visit America in 1903. Basically, his knowledge about American politics is based on Bryce books. And he visited, he met uh, with uh, Teddy Roosevelt and uh, the Secretary of State, uh, John Hay, you know, in the White House. He kind of had a similar like uh, appreciation for like uh, Bryce 
idea that most time of the American politics, the, the politicians, the statesmen leaders are very mediocre because they have to like cater to the populists like uh, demanding, which is not very noble. But he said that he noticed that like in, in time of crisis, in time of crucial decision to be made, like American democracy also seems to be able to produce in like uh, outstanding leaders like Lincoln uh, in the beginning, like uh, George Washington and those great guys. And in his time, he think like that crucial moment of imperial competition with the European powers, like uh, Teddy Roosevelt was able to like rise and promote some like passive policy around the body of you know, that. And I think that as a follow up, also why do you think like, especially in, in times of crisis, we see some like good leadership yeah, in American politics. That's fascinating about the uh, visit with uh, Roosevelt. Hey, thank you for that. This is Liang Kishao, or Liang. Yeah. It's easier to remember. So, 1903 or? Yeah, 1903. So, Quang Yu is writing a dissertation on comparing Tocqueville and Liang uh, and on democracy and the nation. And, and there's a chapter on America. So fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What's your timetable? When do you think you'll have time? Uh, I'm working on only the right now, maybe within one or two years. So I'm a PhD candidate. So we're basically working on dissertation. On the, I'm asking the same question as you asked. Okay. <laughs> That's the question. Yeah. 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 Professor Riley is your professor. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, just thank you for that. And look, uh, I, I can agree that dealing with democracy is a challenge that presidents face, and you need to be able to deal with the Democratic electorate in order to be elected, so you can in the legitimate exceptions without necessarily agreeing with the Bryce conclusion that we can't have great men president. It's just an additional challenge you have to face. You need to be able to figure out how to connect with the American people. There's a variety of ways of doing that. George Washington, when he was at Valley Forge, he would play uh, he would have portrayals of uh, Addison's play Cato to the troops, and he would watch it with them to kind of bond with them and buck up their morale in those first difficult winters. Um, Lincoln, we mentioned, was always reading um, popular human, human humorists in the press and sharing uh, funny stories with people as a way to connect. So if you can't connect to the people, you can't move their vote. And I think it's just an important part of a democratic leader. Hello? You know, the UK has produced some of the main leaders, um, like uh, Winston Churchill, who technically wasn't elected, right? I mean, he, uh, he yeah. took over the government after uh, it, it collapsed uh, in the name of Chamber, failure of Chamberlain's policies. Um, Roosevelt was elected four times, and even though he was a patrician, he um, so had some uh, strong demagogic characteristics and he knew how to appeal to the people. And so I don't think our problem is too much for us. I think it is, you have to find people who know how to arrive at a democratic system, who also have the training and the understanding and the wisdom to be good leaders. And I think we have seen people who can do it, like Washington, like Reagan, uh, Roosevelt was very helpful, uh, both Roosevelt's in some, in some ways. So it's doable, it's your target. You see a correlation between presidential performance and knowledge of history. Are there cases of really good presidents who really don't know their history? So I'm thinking of the counterexample of good presidents who did know history. Like Harry Truman, for example, is constantly reading history. He said that I'm paraphrasing him. The only thing new in this world is the history you haven't read yet. Uh, so I think history is extremely helpful. And, uh, and you know, I mentioned uh, B.B. Nansen Young in the memoir. He talks about how he talked to his father and asked his father, who was a great scholar himself. Uh, what leaders need. He says history. That's the, that's the guide to everything. So I do think that uh, knowledge of history is ex extremely important. Um, so let, let's talk for a second about Charles Ford. I don't think he's a great president, uh, but I think he made a great decision in a key moment in terms of uh, making the decision to pardon Nixon, which again hurt his political prospects, but helped in the country. I never think of him as a great historian or a hugely widely read person. Uh, but you know, I think people can come to the right place and 
And then there, there's a lot of disagreement about Andrew Jackson. Some people thought he was a great president. Some people thought he was a Democrat. Some people thought he was a Democrat, thought he was a great president. Uh, but he wasn't particularly knowledgeable about history. Although it's hard to compare people who uh, learned in an earlier era where there was much more of an emphasis on history than today, where you could probably get by with an entire college education without taking any serious history class. So um, I think history helps, would be how I would say it. And not having history is an obstacle to overcome. Yeah, I'm curious about the president's relation to the administrative state because, uh, you know, we have OIRA and uh, OMB, which, uh, you know, since, since Reagan, uh, we have this cost benefit analysis that somewhat has some influence over the administrative state. But first day of office, we see Biden maybe reconsidering this and saying the, uh, in one of his first executive orders, that the administrative state should just consider cost benefit analysis, should consider things like uh, equity, uh, race, all these other things. Um, and be a little more blunt that the past president, uh, Trump, uh, at least perceived that he was constantly at battle with the administrative state. He used the term deep state, but with also all of his, uh, uh, a lot of his other uh, uh, ideas and policies were blocked by this broader administrative state that isn't all secret. Uh, and he's proposed, and people within the, uh, what might be the future Trump uh, White House have proposed the number one priority as being to battle with the administrative state, firing a lot of uh, uh, career officials, and, and really just doing some pretty drastic measures. So I'm curious, is this unprecedented, or can we look back and see other presidents having this real antagonistic uh, interaction with the administrative state or any solutions? Yeah, it's, it's a terrific question. There's a lot to unpack there. So let's talk a little bit about OIRA. I don't know people know what OIRA is. No one's, OIRA is the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. It is a division within the Office of Management Budget that has oversight over all regulations throughout the federal government. It's staffed mainly by career officials, but the head of OIRA is a political appointee. That was John Graham's job in the Bush administration. Okay. So OIRA is, uh, it, was, you know, it was legislation enabling it that passed around 1980, but then Reagan, given this tool, uh, writes, I think it was an executive order that gives it this authority and its mission to use cost benefit analysis to look at every rate. I think it's a hugely useful agency and very helpful. But would you say the administrative state was bigger before OIRA or after? Clearly after, right? I mean, the regulatory regime has only grown and grown since then. And maybe you could say without OIRA, it would have grown more. I don't know. It's kind of large to tell. So we are in a situation where we are seeing a rise of, a, I would say, an overregulated America, where I mean, everything has to be regulated. And I was just uh, reading a study about. Um, um, U.S. procurement efforts in the Defense Department it said that um, it costs twenty dollars for every. For, we have to spend twenty dollars in procurement dollars for every dollar for every dollar that China spends on the equivalent amount of um, weaponry or technology. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the, the regulatory state, the regulatory structures we impose upon not only defense contractors but all businesses. So I'm not sure we're getting enough truck for our regulatory bank. Um, and then that's something to consider. Uh, have there been other presidents um, at war with the administration? I mean, I can't think of another president who did it in the way Trump did. But it's certainly part of the standard Republican rhetoric in terms of I'm going to cut back regulations. If every president says they're going to cut back regulations, very few do. What you see in Republican administration, not all of them, but most of them, is a reduction in the size of the growth of the regulatory state relative to the Democratic which is not a reduction in the size of government or the regulatory state. So it's something we, we need to uh, certainly need to think about because at some point you just it just becomes sclerotic. You're too overburdened by regulations and you really can't do anything. It, it kills entrepreneurship, it kills innovation, it kills jobs. Uh, that said, we have a safety loving regime. Right? And every time something goes wrong, you know, I put my finger on a uh, on this paper, then you know, somebody wants to do a regulation on the sharpness of the edges of paper to prevent paper cuts in the future. Uh, so it's, it's 
it's not based in nothing. It's based in a lot of uh, litigiousness and concern about safety that a lot of these regulations arise. And, and I do think we're going to have to develop some kind of reckoning on it. But we also have this situation that talked about John Cross this morning, where we have a separation of power in the three branches of government, and the judicial and the and the executive. And they're all kind of trying to assert their own power. And in recent years, Congress has backed off. And to the extent that the, the executive agency is pushing forward, they're pushing on an open door because Congress isn't resisting. And so Congress will pass a thousand page statute, but that leads to 200,000 pages in the, in the uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory agenda books because it, um, and then the federal register, because there's so much that they cede to the administration in developing the details of regulations. So, I mean, I have a lot of problems with a lot of things Trump said. I don't think he was wrong to do a serious analysis of regulations and try and find ways to curtail them. I don't think he succeeded in that effort, but I think perhaps a, uh, perhaps a more judicious president with the same concerns might have more force to come. Um, the recent literature in uh, Congress indicates a decline in incumbency advantage due to polarization. And you talked earlier about constituency relations for the president. And I'm curious if it's uh, if there's any room for reaching that median voter anymore, or if it's only party relations moving forward. That might be a reason for why we have such low assessments of president. When John F. Kennedy ran for president, his campaign manager said we're going to be we're going to compete in every state. We're going to win in every state. And they had a legitimate case to be made. And, we're trying. Hey, um, and that was a very close run election. The two states, Illinois and Texas, got the other way. Nixon was the, and then there were questions about those states and uh, the voter totals. Now. So we're now in a different place. Right now, we've got red America and blue America. Can you go into any election knowing that the Democrats have about 180 or 12 votes kind of locked up and the Republicans have 150 locked up? I mean, something like that. I mean, and you know the um, you, you know the suspects we're talking about, right? Massachusetts, California, New York, uh, Maryland, Hawaii are always going to go Democrat, whereas Indiana and um, Texas and Florida increasingly, and now Ohio um, and the Mountain West states and uh, Idaho, Montana, all those are going to go Republican, and then we have to be excited out over or maybe six or seven states. It's a very very narrow battlefield. Now, part of this is the great geographic sort. It's happened in the last 30 years. It used to be people would go to Congress and they'd talk a big Republican game in Idaho, and then they get to DC and they'd vote however they wanted. It might be more Democratic, or, or they might talk a big uh, Republican, uh, Democratic game in, in, in somewhere in the South, and then they play it differently than they were in DC. Now, with the rise of the internet and the rise of C SPAN, we're much more aware of what's going on, and people have started to vote. For people who fit their state's demographic makeup. And so you no longer have a Northeastern liberal Republican like a Jacob Javits, and you no longer have a Southern Democrat like a Sam Nunn. You have uh, Democrats in the Northeast and uh, in the far West um, along the coast, and you have Republicans in you know, much of the great middle of the country. And that's just the way it is right now. Um, but that's not the way it's always going to be. I mean, I said that uh, 60 years ago, Kennedy said they were going to beat every state. Maybe we'll get back to that place. Uh, before the Trump election of 2016, nobody thought that the Republicans had a chance in those three states of Wisconsin, um, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. They won all three. So these things can change. Uh, and and Florida, for example, uh, DeSantis always bragged about this, that it was a blue state when he started. And that was a pretty red state. And it's not that long ago that he was elected 2018 as governor. Kind of so things change. I think under COVID, you saw a lot of people leaving the Northeast, leaving New Jersey, New York, leaving California, and leaving Illinois because of the restrictiveness of their COVID regimes, but also because of you. You can now do you know you can do cross comparisons of tax rates and regulatory burdens, and uh, so a lot of people have moved to Florida and Texas in the last couple of years, and, and so there's been a movement away from blue states to red states demographically, 
And that could play out two ways. It could make red states more powerful and in help Republicans, or it could bring blue voters into red states and make them less red. We, we don't know what's going to play out. I remember in the uh, 70s, again, in Phillips, we talked about that work we did yesterday. He talked about the southeastern tilt, that the US was tilting in a way that people were leaving the Northeast and kind of running downhill into the Southwest for a bunch of reasons. One of them was uh, the, the rise of air conditioning. Before the 1960s, there's no air conditioning. You don't live in Arizona. You have air conditioning. You can live in Arizona quite happily. Um, but it wasn't just that. It was the sense that there was more freedom out west, and less crime, and fewer burdens. And so uh, we have these demographic sorts that happen periodically. We have a census once a decade that tells you what's happened and reapportions the seat. I'm very curious to see that 2030 census and where, where things stand. Uh, you know, are the blue voters who are going to Texas and Florida making them more uh, you know, left red? Or are they just making them more um, intense in their redness because they, uh, the people who left are the ones who were willing to get up and say, you know, New York, I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to change my, you know, either I'm a Republican who's unhappy here or I'm a Democrat who sees the folly of my way and wants to try and, uh, and move my way in Texas. And so if that happens, then Texas gets five more electoral votes and Florida gets more electoral votes, and New York and, and California become less important. And suddenly, that 180 will 50 split I talked about at the very outset of the presidential campaign becomes maybe 180 for the Republican states, 150 for the Democratic states. And then they're the ones who have to run an inside straight, meaning they have fewer pathways to the Electoral College. I'm not saying that's how it's going to happen. I'm saying in 2030, when the next census happens, we're going to learn a lot more about whether that is going to happen. So I'm just not one who tries this idea that just because it is its way at the moment, it will always be. That way, and I remember in 2020, when Tim Russer uh, took that uh, he took a chalkboard and he was talking about the, 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 um, the various scenarios where Gore could win, where Bush could win, very very tight ballot. That was the first election that I remember in my life, and I follow this stuff pretty closely. Where we really talked about red states and blue states, and the red states were red and going to stay red, and blue states were going to be blue and going to stay blue. And for these last 20 years, for the most part, with that big exception where. Uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Spartan, and Pennsylvania, for the most part, the states have stayed pretty consistent. But there are changes. Georgia might be changing, North Carolina is changing. So uh, I think in the moment, it seems like it's going to be forever, but over the long term, you see that change. Indiana has changed as well. In 2000, the early 2000, there was a Democratic governor here, and the Democratic senator. So well, that, that's another issue that you raised earlier really, that's very interesting, which is it used to be a state like Indiana, which is pretty much voted. Or the Republican candidate, like every year since six, since six, seven, eight, 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 eight. But one time in the last 50 years, Indiana went Democratic on the presidential level, right? But it would send Democratic senators occasionally and Democratic governors. And now, in the last two election cycles, every single state has voted for senator along how they voted for the president, with the exception of West Virginia, Joe Manchin. Republican state for president, you want a senator. So there's the sense now that we're really not going to be able to fool people and say, oh, well, I'm a Democrat, but I'm a good old Democrat. So vote for me in this Republican state. Or I'm a Republican, like Chris Christie in 2009 in New Jersey. I'm a, you know, I'm a Republican, but you can trust me, Republican in this blue blue state of New Jersey. That, that's not happening as much anymore. And, and this, this is not necessarily a good sign for the terms of democracy. I had a, another question. It's almost up here, but uh, it goes back to history. So uh, Lincoln's cabinet, so the ability of the president to include in the cabinet uh, people who openly disagreed, actually contested for power. Um, who, how, how do you get trust, uh, the trust of those people? And how do you make sure that you can trust them in turn? Uh, is there an alchemy for that? Uh, what's, what's the recipe here? I'm asking, uh, it's a loaded question on my part. So alchemy is the right word. <laughs> and there's no sign to depend on, on personal. And there's no scientific way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Trust me, we, we talked yesterday a little bit about how presidents often rely on friends or family members. I brought up on Ken earlier. Because they know them before they enter the political arena. And once you enter the political arena, anyone you talk to, they're suspicious of because they want something. Now, maybe it's, you can trust them also. There's natural suspicion. So it's hard to 
uh, develop that kind of trust, especially with someone who was an, an explicit rival for the uh, for the, the nomination, like with the Hillary and Obama teams. And I think Obama argued has re had relatively low levels of fighting in the administration. It doesn't mean none. Everyone has some. But there was tension between the Hillary people and the Obama people, and Hillary people didn't want to go along with what the Obama people said in terms of uh, who personnel references were. And there was at least one person that Hillary wanted in the State Department, uh, Sidney Blumenthal, unless I'm sure is a big fan of uh, um, uh, for the long one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, anyway, Sidney Blumenthal was a, a, a Clinton hitman, a hatchet man from the Clinton, and the Obama team vetoed him. Very rarely, the Secretary of State is one that people be back, actually actively vetoed by the White House. So uh, there, there was tension between the Hillary people and the Obama people as well. But it also benefits to bringing her up. This gets to another question, which has to do with the power of the presidency. Is it the case that, in fact, if I mean, you know, politics is transactional, I've got a cabinet member. You know, who is uh, giving me problems? Can I do certain things with regard to his programs, his pet interests, et cetera? My sense is there's less room for that now. I mean, I remember being very frustrated more than once that so much of what I had to do as an agency head um, really was tightly controlled either out of Congress or the White House. There wasn't much discretion built into the system. Uh, yeah, look, it's uh, it, it, I think a good example of this is with Congress, right? We used to have um, the ability to uh, earmark certain pet projects, and the way you could get a recalcitrant member to vote for you was saying we need to do this earmark, and they and they took that away. Uh, and you know, a lot of the earmarks were going to boondocks. Not to do airports, but on the other hand, it made it harder to get that political grease that moved things along. And also with greater transparency, I mean, you never know if some watchdog group is going to go after you because you know, your brother is affiliated with a hospital in your district and they got money and then they're going to make it sound like you're, you know, uh, you're bought and paid for because your brother works in the hospital that happens to be the biggest employer in your district, right? So sometimes it's innocent, it's innocuous, but you can still get a hit for it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, our, our lack of distrusting society mm -hmm. makes it harder to uh, develop these relationships. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lyndon Johnson is brilliant. He used every member of Congress in what they need. That's amazing. That's amazing. And you don't have that anymore. Um, not only because people don't take the time to figure it out, but because you don't have the capacity to fulfill their needs, to scratch their interests, as it were, in a way that Johnson did. Let's follow up on Nick Clifford's question. I think we have a little time here. We have five minutes. So just, 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 quick, just quickly on this. In the last 10 years, we've seen intelligence agencies slowly and inexorably take on like a little bit of a parapolitical role and have intruded into domestic politics. We also see this in Israel just a little bit at the margins. Is this, have we seen this in history or is this really terra incognita? That is an interesting question. I mean, you think about the, uh, I mean, you can't think about the Soviet Union without the KGB, I and mean, they basically had a political role in terms of enforcing political conformity. Uh, you think about still do. Well, not the SPR, but they do. Um, or, or you think of East Germany, right? And, uh, Nazi. Did you ever see the movie The Lives of Others? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. One of the best movies I've ever seen. Um, certainly, when I make my list of movies, my favorite foreign. I said there was a mistake. There is a no, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's not a rest. They come and, and uh, try to enter a house during the daylight, and, and, and the communism is almost at night. When the knock comes at night, you know. Uh, but this is a movie about the lack of trust in a society where everyone is an informant. And you found out these people who, you know, you've been watching all the movie, you didn't know they're informants, and then you find out that everyone was informed, informing on everybody, and wives on husbands, and brothers on sisters, and you know, parents on children, every single person was an informant. And so how do you build trust in a society like that? So is that a parapolitical role? I would argue yes. They, they, they had this political role. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the CIA is specifically precluded of being involved in domestic affairs. Uh, but think about the FBI under Watergate. 
right? And we were leaking the damaging information that destroyed um, Nixon. Now, Mark felt motivations in being deep throat were uh, he was pissed off because he was passed over, right? But he still ended up having an important role in sharing his secrets about Watergate with Woodward and Mercy. Without him, maybe so yeah, I think it's good. Like, you know, you want, well, I'm from China, so I think I know you, you work in the US government. So, like, have you ever like, deal with Chinese? Of, I mean, you are not in the diplomatic, but I assume maybe you have some else too. No, I did a lot of diplomatic yeah. work. Yeah, okay, great. Right. So, what's your impression with those Chinese higher officials? Because the, I'm curious, because these guys are not. Usually, like unlike Western said, they are not like uh, usually exposed in public. We don't know much about their personalities. We can we can only know from like afterwards. Maybe they are when they are in jail and their things mm -hmm. are revealed. So, what's your impression with that? These funny guys or uh, interesting guys? Like, or they are very ideological? The two things. So, when I was in government, it was a different time. Right? The U.S. Yeah. believed that China was moving in democratic election uh, direction. Because they had liberalized the economy, and then you know it is, it is not the same type of communist economy that it was, but it's still a communist political system. It was a non-free political system, and I just think the U.S. got it wrong about the direction of things that go with China. So they didn't really understand that. But in terms of trying to figure out foreign officials, you know, I, I never had the privilege to go to China law, but I would be with the CIA before and after I'd go on certain foreign trips in certain countries. And there was one country that I went to, I'm not going to say it, but um, I went to this country and they asked me about the leader of the country. And uh, they asked me all kinds of questions and they asked something about language. I said, oh, his English is perfect. And they said, we know his English is perfect. We want to know how his Arabic is. And he looked at his own people. And, uh, you know, it happened to be that there was a uh, protester mm -hmm. and he said, yeah, you have to. This leader and shouted down the protester in Arabic. So I said, I don't speak Arabic, but he's not a pretty cool one. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, the US government is always looking for ways to uh, uh, what's going on in non democratic society. I don't think we've sorted out, and as we saw from the, uh, the Tachara leaks uh, last week, uh, so we're not that good at guarding our own secrets. So um, it's, it's a constant game, and we're not necessarily ahead of curve. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's very interesting stuff. We can talk for hours. Yeah, so that makes it.